So I live in an apartment complex right next to a 7-Eleven, literally about a two minute walk from my door. So, since all this quarantine lockdown mess, I've been staying up later than usual, maybe around 2 or 3 a.m. most nights. So last night, a little bit after 12, I had a taste for some chips and decided I'd just go cross the street to 7-Eleven real quick, which I go to regularly. I make my way over, and on my way in, I had to pass this man who was browsing on the red box kiosk. I don't think much of it. I go inside, get some snacks, pay, and head out the door. As I'm coming out, though, the red box man is literally staring dead at me with these scarily bright light blue eyes. But not wanting to freak myself out even more, I say to myself, maybe he's zoned out or something and deep in thought. I wander into La La Land myself sometimes, so by thinking that, I was trying to make myself more comfortable having to walk past this strange man. I'm headed back into my apartment complex, which is on this side of the street. It has a creaky gate door. I realized as I was walking that I never heard it slam behind me, like I always have every time before. I look back, and the man is standing right behind me, not close up on me, but still definitely following. Once again, trying to ease my mind, I think to myself that he must be going home. I also noticed, though, that he didn't have any discs in his hand, for as much as he was at the kiosk the whole time I was in the store, taking my sweet, indecisive time. Not wanting to come off as scared, I kept my same pace. I probably should have sprinted, though, because fuck being nice. Anyways, I'm literally just a few steps away from my door, which is upstairs, when the man randomly calls out to me. Hey, do you have a lighter? Out of instinct, I turned my head to the fact I knew someone was speaking to me, and responded. No, I don't. Sorry. I didn't want to just go up my stairs, because I didn't want to let this man know exactly which apartment I live in. I was planning on walking around until I lost him, but he asked me another question. Hey, could I use your bathroom? No, sorry, my roommates probably wouldn't be comfortable with me letting someone in this late. I don't have any roommates, but I damn sure didn't want this man getting any ideas thinking I was by myself. I kept on walking, but the man was still following me. I simply ask him, do you live around here or something? I have a buddy that does, and he was supposed to meet me across the way there, but maybe he fell asleep. I've never been here before, but I do know his door is number 201. Could you help me find it? 201 is my door. If you have a friend that lives over here, why are you asking to use my bathroom? I knew this man was lying, and up to something. I quickly came up with, 201, that should be right past the pool next to the laundry area. My friends are waiting for me, so I should get going. My gut told me to head to my car, though, because what if he watched where I was going and decides to give me a surprise later on? No, I watch too many movies and read too many stories uploaded on here. I start heading towards the parking lot, not running, but definitely walking way quicker than before. I look back and realize that the man is chasing me at this point. I hurry up and pull my keys out of my pocket. I jump into my car and immediately lock the doors. The man runs up and starts pounding on my driver's side window. Open the door, you bitch! I can't help but focus on those creepy blue eyes, but I also notice that he was reaching for something in his pocket. I start up my car before I can see what it is he's going to pull out. I heard a loud pop, but I didn't give a fuck in that moment, as long as I could get the fuck out of his presence. I drove for about five minutes down the street to this Arco gas station before I finally called the police. Waiting on the police to arrive, I noticed what the popping sound was. This wacko had popped my back tire with a switchblade. Of course, when the police arrive and check the area, the motherfucker was long gone. They did question the 7-Eleven clerk, and he let them know that the man had been up there a few times since last week. He'd never been a problem before, but he was obviously homeless. I'm still shook up about what went on last night. I think I'm just going to chill on late night trips to the 7-Eleven for a while.
my name is Charlie. I used to smoke a lot of weed back in the day when I was a teenager, but it became very bland and boring, but I also told myself not to try any other drugs. At school, my friend Christine told me that she heard the best weed was on a dark web. I knew a little about the deep and dark web, but I thought that drugs would be something geared more toward the deep web. Maybe I didn't know as much as I thought. My friend got with me later and told me she ordered me some weed. About a week later, I was at home by myself on a Friday night when someone knocked at my door. I went to the door and looked out of the peephole and saw some guy with a black t-shirt, black Yankees cap, with sunglasses on, and it looks like a box in his hands. I was immediately skeptical because it was 9 p.m. He didn't need sunglasses at night, and no one delivered packages this late. I didn't say anything because I figured he would just walk away. I called Christine to ask her how long that order would take, and she said about a week. I told her that there's a man outside my door with a package. Could that be him? She asked, why would someone be standing outside your door with weed? Then all of a sudden, I heard, Hey, Charlie, I have your package. I know you're home. I see you through the window. I turned around, and this man was standing on a patio on my back porch looking through the sliding door windows. I'm guessing this guy went from my front door to my back porch because I wasn't answering the door. I told my friend and she said to call the cops. He was trying to get in the back messing with the door handle. I hung up on my friend and I called the cops. I ran out of sight of this guy and I didn't hear him anymore. About five to ten minutes later, the cops showed up. That box was outside my back door and written on it was, you're lucky. And there was nothing in the box but paper. After that, I never spoke with my friend Christina anymore because, honestly, I didn't trust her. I thought she tried to set me up. Anytime someone brings up the dark web or even the deep web, I will either change the topic or I'll be quiet. I used to visit it occasionally, but after that situation, I've never done it again. My name is Kevin. This story took place seven years ago when I was 13. I had a sleepover at my friend Paul's house one night. This wasn't the first time we had a sleepover. What we would do is play video games until around 11 p.m. Then we would start trolling people on Facebook. And this night was no different. Paul and I spent the evening eating McDonald's, playing video games and watching scary movies up until around 10.30 p.m. when we logged into Facebook using a fake account we created and would send messages to people we knew. We came across one guy who lived in our area whose name was Frank. He was a black dude, buff, and had tattoos. For some reason, we thought it would be funny to prank call him as his phone number was listed in his bio. We had a ring twice before he picked up. He picked up with a firm, yeah. Paul made a joke about Frank and his appearance, and we both were laughing. Frank then started cursing and yelling, and we hung up the phone laughing our heads off. The rest of the night, we made more prank calls and commented childish things on people's accounts. I think it was around 1 a.m. or something. Me and Paul were getting tired while watching a movie and then we received a text from an unknown number. I asked who was that, and it said, that's so funny, with a picture attached to it. After examining the picture properly, we saw it was a street sign that wasn't far from Paul's house. We both looked at each other, scared and confused. What if they come to my house, Paul asked. I tried to calm him down and think rationally. He wasn't at his house, only nearby. Maybe he is only guessing where we are to freak us out a bit. We carried on watching the movie, hoping the phone wouldn't go off again. 
About 10 minutes later, however, we received another text without a picture this time, and it read, look outside. Me and Paul froze in fear. I remember being so afraid to even move. The lights were off, so you couldn't see us from outside. So I got the courage to take a sneaky look through the blinds. I couldn't see anyone, not even a car. After scanning the street properly, I said, Paul, there's no one out there. He checked as well. I told him it was probably just a text to scare us. He doesn't know where our house is exactly, like I said earlier. It didn't leave our minds, but we started to calm down a bit. Plus, we didn't receive a text message for a while now. And about an hour later, me and Paul went downstairs to make some noodles. As we were cooking, we get a phone call from an unknown number. Of course, it had to be that guy who had been texting us. I said, don't answer. The phone stopped ringing. Paul then texted the number saying, I'm sorry if we upset you, but it was just a prank. The next thing that happened was the scariest thing I've ever experienced. A phone lit up just outside the kitchen window from the backyard, and a very large man was standing there looking at us. It was Frank. He looked so angry and held up a large knife and made a huge scratch into the window to where our necks were. We jumped out of our skin, screamed, and ran upstairs to Paul's parents. We told them there was a man outside. They came down and checked the backyard and Frank was gone. We didn't tell the whole truth as we were afraid of getting in trouble. I don't think we slept the whole night. We still had sleepovers at Paul's house, but we never pranked or trolled anyone again. We also didn't hear anything from Frank, but we didn't need to. We got the message. I never even met him. I didn't know his name or face. I was blissfully unaware of his very existence. I will never know why or when it started. I'm glad for that, I guess. I moved into my very small apartment in February of last year. My landlord, Olivia, was a sweet older woman who would cook too much food and bring me leftovers. She was great to me, even after I told her my problem. I'm antisocial, but she didn't mind renting to a reclusive young girl who reminded her of her daughter. Every few weeks, she would knock on my door and then leave, letting me know she was leaving something for me. I loved that. Not even my family would cook so well. The next morning, I wash and leave her empty containers outside my door and by an hour or so, she would come back and take them away. My other neighbours seemed fine, but I never really talked to them. I worked from home, so any time I was ever forced to go out, I rushed out and into my apartment, avoiding an uncomfortable situation. I loved living alone. It was everything I hoped for. I could just breathe. By April, though, I started noticing things were not right. Things were moving, or plain disappearing. I was convinced it was just anxiety, caused by my new medication and the move. Another side effect was that it made me so drowsy. Since I hated seeing the doctor, I just dealt with it. I took naps during the day now, and eventually stopped caring. That is, until one incident doubled my paranoia. Olivia brought me some sort of Greek toss salad for lunch one day, and I enjoyed it with my friend, Netflix. I fell asleep in the middle of Portlandia, and I woke up that evening at 5pm per usual. What wasn't usual was that my bedding on the opposite side of me was disturbed. I only sleep on my right side, always. Even more, it felt warm. 
My first thought was that I must have rolled around a lot, but I knew it was too odd to dismiss. I got up and I searched my apartment, gripping my phone with 911 typed in. Nothing else was disturbed. Everything was exactly like it should be. I let it go. For the next two weeks, everything was normal. Pardon the occasional misplaced shoe or drawn back shower curtain. I thought about telling someone, my parents, maybe Olivia, but if it's not life or death, I'm not reaching out to anyone. I wasn't scared. I was nervous, perhaps a little stubborn as well, but I stayed. I'm not letting some stupid anxiety ruin my lovely, lonely world. May came, and it was getting worse. My underwear, toothbrush, hell, maybe even my food was being misplaced. Every time I woke up, there was some strange odour in the air. I finally realised this won't go away if I keep ignoring it. I called up my mum, and I begged to come and stay for a few days. When I got home, I told them everything. Saying it out loud solidified any creepy suspicions. That weekend, my dad went to my apartment, and what was found was true horror. Written all over the walls was, Come back, baby, please. He ran out and called the police. There was no one living in my apartment, but someone definitely had access besides me. The investigation revealed a man, Henry, the son of my landlord Olivia, was in a projected relationship with me. They showed me his confession on tape. He admitted coming into my apartment every night and every day with his mother's extra key. He claimed that we were in love and that he had my permission. He drugged his mother's food that she left out for me, which of course caused my drowsiness, and he would let himself in, watch me sleep, touch my hair, and kiss my shoulder. The leftovers in the fridge were tested and confirmed that suspicion. I was absolutely horrified and disgusted. A man I never knew existed collected my hair, clothes, and trash, and practically lived in my apartment for four months. This happened two years ago. My name is James, and my girlfriend at the time was Susie. Susie and I got into an argument about a girl. She was just texting me about the edibles. The girl just wanted to know who had edibles and the prices on them. I remember I used the bathroom, and after I came back to the living room, I saw Susie on my phone, and she looked angry. She started asking questions about the girl. You know, regular questions. Am I cheating on her? Is she pretty? The most disturbing one was, if she was right here right now, would I kiss her or my girlfriend? That was the PG version of what she really asked. I told her she texted me about edibles, and besides that, the girl doesn't even like guys. But I don't think my girlfriend knew that. So we continued to argue for about 20 minutes. I started to say this is stupid and I remember looking at the clock and it was 11 p.m. Since she was staying over that night, I told her we should just stop fighting and try to get some sleep or watch a movie. We agreed and turned on a movie. We were watching Don't Be a Menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. As we were watching the movie, I noticed she was on her phone typing fast and just really involved in her phone. Every time I leaned in a little closer to see what was going on, she would always move her phone away and just give me a cold shoulder. We continued watching the movie until I heard somebody at my door. I said, I wonder who that could be at this time. Again, I looked at the clock and now it was one in the morning. My mom was in her room sleep, but after she heard the doorbell, she woke up asking who that was. I told her I didn't know, but I was going to find out. So as I started going to the door, I heard whispering from my girlfriend, 
like she was on the phone or something. I didn't really pay attention to it, so I finally got to the door and I looked through the peephole. I was met with some tall dude, wearing mostly all black. I talked to him through the door, and I asked him, what do you want? He replies with, I'm just here to drop off a package, sorry I'm late. And I was thinking, who delivers a package at one in the morning? So I told him to leave, and he could come back some other time to deliver the package. He said no, in a deep commanding voice. Just in that moment, my ex-girlfriend Susie comes walking towards me with a grin on her face. She says to me, so you're really not going to tell me who that girl was texting you? I explained that she wasn't anybody, and I didn't know her like that. And this is the wrong time to be asking me a question like that when there is somebody at the door I didn't know. To this day, what she said still gives me the chills just thinking about it. She said, the guy at the door, he's here to get rid of you. At first, I gave out a nervous laugh and said, that's not funny. She said, yeah, it is. Well, at least for me, it is. As this was going on, the guy at the door kept messing with the door handle, trying to get in. So I was leaning up against the door, preventing him to come in. As I looked behind me, Susie was gone. A few seconds later, she comes back with a knife and said, either he's going to get you or I will. I started flipping out and thinking, what am I going to do? I can't die right here. Just in that moment, I heard a commanding voice saying, back away from the door or we'll shoot. I thought to myself, what the fuck? So I swung open the door and there was the police. One of the police officers told Susie to drop the knife because when I took my eyes off of her and I opened the door, she was right behind me, like literally right behind me. But the officer saying that must have scared her and she dropped the knife immediately. Apparently, while all this was going on, my mom called the cops and explained the situation the best she could. She pretended to be asleep so she wouldn't cause attention to herself and could get help as fast as she could. The police arrested both of them and took them to the station. Apparently, the guy that was there was her cousin. And the whole time the movie was playing, she was texting him, telling him to come over and quote unquote, deal with me. I'm just happy that I'm still here today. My mom saved my life. I don't even want to imagine what they would have done with me. I'm a 28 year old male, but when this happened, I was about 23. I worked at a mom and pop's pizza shop in a place in Northern California. It's a small farm town and has a few suburbs near it. I kind of did everything since I knew the family. They trusted me with running things while they were gone. This night, though, I was working deliveries and got the weirdest one of my life. Everything seemed fine when I took the order. The lady ordered anchovies on her pizza, and I always think people who order that are weird as shit. She made a point to tell me the pizza had to be hot when it got there, or she wouldn't pay for it. So I get the pizza and throw it in the warmer and drive to her house before any of my other deliveries. I'd like to tell you guys that her house was creepy and run down, but it looks like your average one-story new housing development home. I rang the doorbell and put on my fake-ass customer service smile. You all know what I'm talking about. And as soon as she opens the door, I knew this was going to be bad. The haggard old lady who looked like she was a smoker of 50-plus years looked me dead in the eyes and said, It had better be hot or I'm not paying like I told you over the damn phone. I understand, ma'am. I made sure to stop by your place first, even though it was last on my list. Bring it in and set it on the table. She said this. And now, I don't normally go inside customers' homes because I read too many stories on no sleep and let's not meet. But at this point, I'm just wanting to kill her with kindness and see where this will go. So I say, No problem. I also brought cheese and ranch for you if you need it. As soon as I opened the bag, she grabbed the box, and her hand was on the bottom of it, just rubbing it. It's not hot enough. You fuckers do this every time, and I'm not paying for this shit. Not a single dime. One thing I have an issue with is my mouth. I don't know when to just shut up and try to understand where people are coming from. Look, lady. Your house is a five-minute drive from our shop. 
and I stopped by your place first. There's no way your pizza is cold. If you refuse to pay, you're going to be 86th, and I'll notate it on your account. She immediately walked into her kitchen and came back out. She had an old pizza from a few weeks prior she had ordered from us, and threw it at me. Take your fucking pizza and get out of my house. You're the devil. She yelled that at me and kept calling me Satan and the devil. Again, my mouth has no filter and I can't control it. I try, but I fail every time. As I'm closing the bag and laughing about how much I hate my job, I tell her, Alright ma'am, you will not be able to order pizza from us again. I hope you have a good day, and God bless you and your house. She kept following me outside to my car, screaming about how I was the fucking devil. And there are families out there just watching this all go down. I get in my car and start driving. Once I'm back, I tell my manager what happened, and she told me that the lady had already called in and screamed to her about what had gone down. Her story was that I cussed her out and got her order wrong. My manager shut her down and said I'd never do anything like that. But here's the weird part. She whispered into the phone to my manager and repeated, Send him back. Send him back. Send him back. She called once a day for almost three months, just whispering this to whoever answered. She started driving by the restaurant and yelling, The devil works here. You're all going to hell. Now, I wasn't scared. I was just pissed and wanted to retaliate, because I can't tell you how many times she tried to follow me back to my apartment when I got off work. One night, I pulled over and got out just for her to stop her car on the road with her lights on, yelling, The devil is here. After this, I jumped back in my car and sped off. Luckily, after six months of dealing with this lady, I found out she was schizophrenic and bipolar and hadn't been on her meds. Her daughter put her in a care home, but when she was cleaning out her house, she saw that her mom had pictures of me all over her bedroom wall with the word, yep, you guessed it, devil, scrawled all over it. She found me and explained everything to me, and thankfully, that was the end of it all. There was a time my parents went on a trip to Europe. I was taking care of their house. I was home for the summer from school anyway, so it was fine. I had been there for a few weeks and it was pretty quiet. I just went to work, came home, had some time with my friend, enjoying the house to ourselves and whatnot. But one night, I was just laying there watching TV when I heard this really weird low whistling sound coming from the window that was behind the couch. It struck me as sort of odd and I just shrugged it off. But then it happened again. It totally sounded like it was a person standing up against the window whistling. I looked out the window and obviously there was no one there. So I figured I should go check it out. If it was something like the wind on a siding, I should probably fix it because that would get annoying. So I walked out into the backyard. The backyard in my parents' house is really, really pretty. It's sparse, but sort of forest that leads to a road on the other side. So I looked at the house and didn't see anything, but then I heard the sound again. It was coming from the woods in the back. I was pretty creeped out at this point, and of course I couldn't see anything in the woods, so I hurried back through the door and I locked it behind me. I never really heard that sound again for the next few days, until one night, I was asleep in my room, and I could have sworn I was awakened by the whistling sound against my second floor window. I listened hard, and it was dead silent. So I decided I should go ahead and look out the window. I did that whole thing where I crept super slowly towards it, and just sort of peeked through it. Outside my window, there was a man just standing there. I was really sleepy. So I can't know how much of this I'm misremembering. But he was just sitting there staring at me. I was completely frozen. And slowly, the man pursed his lips. And I could hear that whistle again. It was crystal clear. It made me feel like crying. I tore myself away from the window and I hid under my covers. The next night, I insisted that my friend stay with me. He did. 
and of course nothing happened. He figured that I was just tired and delirious and maybe I was right. It gets kind of anticlimactic here, but I didn't hear it for another week or so. And when I did, it was just one small whistle just happening randomly, coming from a wall or something like that. It just happens every week or so, and it always freaks me out tremendously. To this day, I would never stay in that house alone anymore. My money situation hasn't been the best lately. With rent and bills to pay, it's been a struggle. In my attempt to make ends meet though, I met someone I wish I hadn't. A few nights ago, I saw an ad on Craigslist, looking for someone to help move a few large items and boxes up from the basement. The job offered 12 bucks an hour cash, and estimated to be around 5-7 to seven hours worth of work. That sounded great to me. And, best of all, it was within walking distance of my house. I emailed the poster of the ad, and everything seemed great at first. He was thankful that someone had answered so quickly, because he really needed to get things done. After a few emails, though, he hits me with something. I want you to know that I'm a gay man. How old are you, by the way? That's a weird message to send. His sexuality should be none of my business. If you call up a plumber to come to your house, you don't share that information with him. I'm a 28-year-old guy, though. I'm in good shape, and I never leave the house without a knife in my boot and a sidearm on my waist. I need the money, and this guy's 68. If he tries anything, I'm confident I can handle myself. Besides that, I like to think the best of people. I try and tell myself that maybe he's just a bit flamboyant and has had trouble in the past hiring people who turned out to be homophobic. The time comes and I get to his house. He comes off as a normal and pleasant dude right from the bat. He's polite and friendly and has a really cool house. It's your typical middle class New England home from the early 40s. Not something I'd want to live in because you're so closed off with smaller rooms but they have a nice charm. He's even furnished it with antiques from the time period. So, I'm put a little at ease with everything going so well at first. He takes me down into the basement, and it is a bit creepy. Let's be honest here, most basements are. Even more so when it belongs to a stranger. He shows me what needs to be done, and I start getting to work. Everything goes fine for the first hour or so. Then, I notice out of the corner of my eye, he's watching me from around the corner. I try and tell myself it's no big deal. He just wants to make sure I'm not stealing any of his stuff, and that I'm doing what I'm supposed to. After a few minutes, he goes away. About 30 minutes later, he comes strolling in wearing nothing but underwear and socks. Oh, sorry, he says. I was just about to take a shower, and I forgot to tell you a few things. Well, that wasn't really the case, as he just repeats something he told me earlier. He's 68, though. Can't expect him to remember everything, right? A little more time goes by, and he calls me from upstairs and tells me to come and take a break and have a glass of water. Sounds good to me. I get upstairs walk into the living room, and he's sitting on the couch, completely naked. I freeze a bit, and he says, Is this okay with you? I told him that I already informed him I was straight, and if this is what he was looking for, he hired the wrong person. He starts apologizing and puts his little buddy away, and begs me to please finish the job, saying that he didn't mean to make me feel uncomfortable. Again, I need the money, so I agree. I figure there's no way this guy could overpower me, and he has no idea I'm carrying. I get back to work, and everything's fine for another couple of hours. I go back upstairs once the job's done to let him know. He tells me no problem, and to have a seat while he goes and gets the money. 
I sit down and take out my phone to browse the internet while I wait. After a few minutes, I just know he's right next to me. It's something most people always manage to realize. I don't know the science behind it, if there is any. I didn't consciously see or hear anything, but maybe your brain picks up on little cues subconsciously. Either way, I turn behind me, and there he is, dick out, going to town on it. I admit I freeze a bit from the shock of it. He reaches out and puts his hand on my shoulder. Now this is probably what creeped me out the most. With his hand on my shoulder, he leans in a little towards me, smiles and says, Now, don't go and tell anyone what you've just seen, okay? This is just our little secret. Nobody needs to know about it, right? That's not a line that should come to your mind if a 28-year-old is your normal victim. That's the kind of thing you get used to saying after doing shit like this to fucking kids. At that point, I jumped up, told him to give me the money he owes me, and started towards the door. He hands me the money while still jerking off, and says again, Don't forget, it's our secret. A few hours pass, and I receive an email from him. Thank you for what you did for me today. I feel as though we bonded and connected on a very special level. This was a wonderful day I'll never forget. I have more work for you tomorrow. Maybe you'll learn to enjoy watching me share my private moments with you. I didn't respond. Being a single mom is hard. Very hard. I hate my job. I have a slew of late pickup charges from my son's daycare and my body has gone fat from years of fast food dinners and alcohol abuse. Every day is a struggle. My mind is a prison cell, and I lost the key to the door so long ago that I don't even care to look for it anymore. That is why when I won a trip to Disney World through my company's annual raffle, I nearly cry tears of joy. Nothing good ever happens to my son and I. The list of our misfortunes are as long as my arm, and this just provided us with the one thing that we thought we would never recover, hope. Hope not just for a fun week, but hope that maybe the perpetual muck that has overtaken our lives ever since my husband left us five years ago would finally start to dissipate. You can imagine my horror then when I lost my son during the final day of our trip. We were making our way over to Space Mountain when suddenly I had to use the restroom. I told my son to sit on a nearby bench while I did my business, and then disappeared into the first clean stall I could find. When I exited the restroom a few minutes later though, he was gone. Fear gripped me as I whirled my head around the scattered crowd, trying my best to locate him before he wandered out of sight. My efforts were futile though. I spent the next five hours scouring the park in a panicked frenzy. No matter how hard I looked though, I couldn't find him. Just as I was about to call the police, I found him sitting on the bench that I had left him on earlier that day. He was wearing a full body Mickey Mouse costume, and I would have walked right past him if I hadn't recognized the worn out Scooby Doo backpack resting on his knees. I ran over to him and wrapped my arms around his head. His body was limp in my arms. If it wasn't for the steady rise and fall of his chest against my thigh, I would have thought he was unconscious. Where have you been? I swear I looked all over Magic Kingdom for you. And where did you get that Mickey Mouse costume? He didn't answer. It was at this point that I became concerned. My son is normally very talkative. It was unlike him to be so reserved, especially after such a traumatic event. Why don't you take off that mask? I want to see that you are okay. I reached down to pull off his mask but he swatted my hands away with such force I staggered back a step. Never before had he hit me. The blow surprised me so much that I stood there, motionless on the sidewalk, for almost a minute, unsure of how to respond. Eventually though, I regained my wits and sat down on the bench next to him. I know you are scared, I said, but everything is alright now. We're together again. You're safe. Once again, no answer. 
Why aren't you talking to me? Are you hurt? No answer. I tried for several more minutes to get him to respond, but I might as well have been talking to a mannequin. All he would do was sit there unmoving on the bench, staring off into the distance through his mouse eyes. The only time he would move was to swat my hands away every time I tried to remove his mask. We sat on the bench for over an hour before I grabbed his hand and led him back to our hotel room. Luckily, he didn't resist as I maneuvered him through a crowd. To my surprise, he followed me with dog-like docility and even allowed me to tuck him into bed that night, Mickey Mouse costume and all. I debated that night whether to contact the park authorities about his disappearance and stolen suit, but decided against it. My gut was telling me that I should, but I was just too exhausted to prolong the matter. He seemed relatively unharmed for one thing, and we had to get to the airport by 6 the next morning. Calling the authorities would potentially extend our stay, and I couldn't afford to buy another pair of plane tickets. So, I kept the matter to myself, and drifted off into a light sleep the moment my head hit the pillow. We arrived home around sunset the next afternoon. My son still wasn't talking, and continued to swat my hands away every time I tried to remove his costume. At this point, my concern skyrocketed. Not only was his behavior so bizarre, but he hadn't eaten or drank anything in over a day. Unless he was sneaking food and water while I wasn't looking, he had to be on the drink of dehydration. I decided to take him to the doctor early that next morning. Something terrible had obviously happened to him while he was missing, and I felt like a failure of mother for waiting so long to get him help. When we arrived at the doctor's office, he threw such a fit that the nurses had to restrain him. No matter how hard they tried to remove his mask though, he always found a way to counter their efforts. It was as if that thing was plastered onto his head. Eventually, the doctor became so concerned that he decided to do an x-ray. He told me that it was the quickest way to assess his health through the costume, and that they would devise a plan while the x-ray process to remove his mask. I thanked him for his help and then watched as they escorted my son into another room. The doctor returned a few minutes later. His face was so pale, I feared that he might pass out. We finished the x-ray, he said, voice shaky. Thank goodness, I said. Is he alright? The doctor stared at me for almost a minute without responding, hands shaking. Is something wrong? His head and spinal cord are the only parts of him underneath the costume. The rest of his body is missing. I'm 22 now, but this happened when I was 16. At the time, I lived in Staten Island, New York. For a little background, I'm a female, and at the time, I was 120 pounds soaking wet, with a height of 5'6". I thought I was invincible. I never imagined anything like this would have ever happened to me. It was March 17th of 2013, around 10.30pm. I was leaving my boyfriend's house. He walked me to the local bus stop as he always did. We joked and laughed while we waited for my bus to show up. Because it was kind of late, there weren't many cars on the street. I happened to notice a black SUV parked across the road. I didn't think much of it at the time. My bus eventually showed up and I said goodbye to my boyfriend and I boarded. I took a seat next to the bus driver. The rest of the bus was completely empty. The driver turned to me once we hit the first red light, and then he asked, What are you doing out this late? It was random and a bit creepy. I replied with, I was just hanging out with my boyfriend. We made small talk, and my initial apprehension was put at ease. The driver then told me that it wasn't exactly safe to be out and about at this hour, and that I should be more careful. I nodded, but as I said before, I was an arrogant 16-year-old who thought she was invincible. As my stop approached, I looked at my phone. The time read 11.30 p.m. My phone's battery was down to 5%. Oh, that's great, I thought to myself as I exited the bus and said my goodbyes to the driver. He told me to stay safe, and I gave him another nod 
as the door folded back shut. For some reason, I just stood there and watched the bus make its way down the street until its taillights were well out of sight. As I stood there at the empty stop, a sensation of what I can only describe as impending doom came over me. I made my way to the bench to sit down. The bus that dropped me off near my house was scheduled to arrive at 11.40. Only 10 minutes. As I sat there staring off into space, thinking about some things I had to do when I got home, a black SUV pulls up to the bus stop. The uneasy feeling I had earlier intensified. But I did my best to play it cool. The man rolls down his window and asks me, Hey, excuse me, do you know what time the bus is supposed to be here? He appeared to be a mix between Spanish and Asian, and had a medium build. At this point, I did not make the connection that this may have been the same vehicle I saw just before I boarded the first bus. I figured that he was probably just waiting for somebody. So I replied, It shouldn't be long. He then asked me how long I had been waiting. It was then that I started to get a little freaked out. This guy was giving me the creeps. But I considered that I might be just overreacting. Perhaps he was just trying to pass the time. But still, I kept my guard up. I answered that I hadn't been waiting long. He then proceeded to try to make more small talk. I was trying to be polite. But I also kept looking at my pitch black phone screen, trying to subtly hint to him that I wasn't interested in conversation. It was dark out by this point. The only luminescence was coming from some distant street lights. However, there were also two big trees outside the bus stop that were positioned in such a way that they blocked out most of the light. So if this guy tried anything, the dark would have provided decent cover. I nervously clenched my phone, the uncomfortable feeling inside increasing with every passing second. He then told me that he was new to the area and didn't know his way around too well. He claimed that he was in the army and was stationed nearby. He then asked me where the beach was. It's just down the street. I told him in a very matter-of-fact way, as if to convey, maybe you should go there so I don't have to look at you anymore. It was then that our eyes met. I could see his face very clearly. His eyes were not like any normal human's eyes. It was as if they were looking right through me, staring at me like a hungry fox who just discovered a trapped, defenseless rabbit. He then asked me, Do you mind if you show me around? Come on, get in the car for a little while. I may have been a naive 16-year-old, but I was not an idiot. I knew that if I got in that car, that would be the last time anyone ever heard from me. I was trying my best to show him that I wasn't afraid, so I politely declined while looking down the street for my bus. He then began to beg and plead. It was really kind of pathetic. I told him no once again. He then said something that I will never forget. Come on, baby. It won't take long. I promise. At that moment, my blood ran cold, and my stomach felt like it was going to drop right out of my ass. I felt absolutely sick, like I was going to throw up. But I kept my cool, and thankfully my bus was now in sight, and coming down the street. A feeling of relief washed over me. I told him no once again, thinking that would be the end of it. He then told me that he would drive me home right afterward. This guy would not give up, and I finally had enough. With all the strength and courage in me, I shouted, No, leave me the hell alone, you fucking loser! As my bus pulled up, I heard him say something genuinely terrifying. And I quote, Fine, bitch, I'll just follow you and see where you live. My heart started to race. My hands broke out in a cold sweat, and my body began to tremble with fear. I quickly got on the bus, and honestly, I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver. I think I was just in a state of shock and was hoping that Mr. Jailbait Hunter in the SUV didn't mean what he said and that he was just pissed off and trying to scare me. When I sat down and looked out of the window, I saw the headlights of the SUV. They were tailing the bus. I thought I was going to have a mental breakdown. When the bus arrived at my stop, I ran like hell. I reached the front door of my house 
which was usually unlocked, but tonight, of all nights, it was locked from top to bottom. I frantically rang the doorbell while going through my bag to find my keys. I then heard someone pull up out front. Without turning around, I knew who it was. Just like in the movies, I dropped the keys as I was trying to put them in the front door. I finally managed to unlock my front door. Before turning the handle, I heard a car door slam shut from behind me. I quickly ran inside and slammed the door shut. In a panic, I explained to my mother and my older brother what happened. My brother ran outside and looked up and down the street. I was shaking, absolutely consumed by terror. My emotions finally got the best of me, and I could no longer hold back my tears. We called the police, and they came and searched the area. They asked me if I had gotten a tag number, and unfortunately, I had to tell the officers that it was too dark to see. But I did notice a sticker of some sort of bird on the back seat driver's side window. It didn't dawn on me until they left that this had been the same SUV that was across the street when I was with my boyfriend an hour prior. They told me that they checked the army base nearby and the surrounding area, but nobody had seen any vehicle matching the description I gave. All I could think about was what the bus driver had said to me and the irony of what took place that same night. Years went by and I didn't think much about this incident after that night. One day, I was scrolling through Facebook when I came across a picture my friend had posted. It was a story of a man who had been following her home from work for the past three days, and it was the same guy who I encountered five years prior. My heart felt like it was going to leap out of my throat. Looking at the post, I noticed that several other women had come forward, and they all shared similar experiences to mine. I ended up finding out that he almost kidnapped a 13-year-old girl. She allowed herself to be lured into his car, but once inside, she noticed a roll of duct tape, some rope, a pair of gloves, and a bottle of what turned out to be chloroform on the floorboard. She ended up jumping out of the window while they were stopped at a red light. I don't know all the details, but apparently he got physical with another woman, who was pregnant and tried to force her into his car. He got pretty ballsy and started trying to abduct women in broad daylight. The news found out that his name was Leo, and it was also discovered that he had a wife and two daughters, who were around three and five. They interviewed his neighbors, and to my surprise, they defended him, saying that all these women were just lying. It's truly unbelievable how stupid people are. Five separate accounts from five different women who have no connection with each other have come forward and shared their experiences. Could you please dislodge your head from your ass and face up to the facts? Anyway, to this day, I have no idea whatever became of him. The last I heard, he was still at large. I hope they caught him, so no other young women have to be subjected to this monster ever again.